Uh, now, the, a lot of people find praxeology, especially the way it's explained in the uh, first 113 pages of Mises' Human Action, very difficult to understand. But what I'm going to be trying to do in this talk, no doubt unsuccessfully, is to convince you that it isn't hard to understand. It's actually quite commonsensical. Now, some people might wonder, well, even if I'm right, uh, isn't it still very abstract? What can you do when you learned about praxeology? Well, uh, one thing, you can always open a praxeology store. Uh, but, well, enough of bad jokes, at least, <laughs> at least uh, intended bad jokes. Uh, now, one uh, idea Mises has that I think is a very striking one is that he contends that economics can, has an important contribution to make to epistemology, the branch of philosophy that studies how we know the theory of knowledge. Uh, normally, we don't, when uh, at least what the time Mises was writing, and probably true since when philosophers are talking about theory of knowledge, they don't normally talk about what goes on in economics. But Mises thinks that uh, philosophers, especially philosophers of science, are making a big mistake when they don't talk about, uh, think about what goes on in economics, because as in his view, economics uses a different method from the method used in the physical sciences. So economics has its own way of approaching the subject matter. But even though the way econ economics uh, works, the way economists reason, is different from that of the physical sciences, it still isn't able to come up with general laws, to arrive at general laws. So Mises says, well, the philosophers, especially philosophers of science, are making a mistake because when they're considering how science arrives at laws, they're operating from an uh, incomplete set of examples. They're not taking account the special way that economics comes up with with laws. Uh, now, when if Mises is right, uh, it raises a problem. If economics has this important contribution to make to theory of knowledge, why have philosophers neglected this? And I should say, when Mises is talking about economics here, although, of course, he has principally in mind the kind of economics, namely Austrian economics, that he himself engages in. He has in mind not only his own Austrian economics, but economics in general, uh, standard price theory. In his view, especially when he was writing in the epistemological problems of economics in the 1930s, was that it was a standard economics that all economists accept. This changed a bit later, especially in macroeconomics, when the theories of Keynes gained prominence. And Mises reacted to that by saying, well, that isn't economics. That's anti-economics. So in Mises' view, all economists accepted a certain body of theory. And he said that the philosophers of science have, are neglecting this. They're not taking account of this new way of, of uh, studying a, a subject matter that enables us to come up with general laws of a kind that are different from those that arrived at in the physical sciences. So as I say, the question is, well, if there is this new way of coming up with, econo with laws, why have philosophers neglected this? You would think that philosophers would be very interested in this because then they'd be, wouldn't this be a very important thing to reason about and say, well, uh, philosophers of science thought that there's a 
a particular way we come up with laws, but there's this other way as well, so you'd expect the uh, philosophers to be interested in this. But Mises has a, a somewhat of a sociological explanation for why they're not, that many people, he thinks, really oppose the notion of economic laws because if there are economic laws, especially the kind that there are, they impose certain limits on what policymakers can do. Uh, for example, it's a consequence of economic laws that minimum wage leg legislation won't succeed in raising wages for workers in it without creating unemployment. Minimum wage laws won't raise wages and have no bad consequences for other workers. So if it, it turns out that economic laws impose restrictions on what policymakers want to do, especially uh, policies that aim for that intervention into the free market, then the policymakers and people who favor those kinds of interventionistic and socialistic measures that the uh, these people oppose won't be very happy about this, and so they'll they they'll react. Mises thinks by just denying that there are economic laws, and Mises suggests that many philosophers, especially I think he has in mind, especially uh, philosophers at the time he was writing, the logical positivists in Vienna, who had these socialistic views and interventionist views, so they would downplay or uh, deny entirely that there are economic laws and wouldn't, con by doing so, they would be neglecting the important contribution that economics has to make to the theory of knowledge. Now, what it, I said there is e uh, economics has a different way of arriving at laws from that of the physical sciences. Well, what is the difference? Uh, in the physical sciences, what we're basically doing is studying matter or energy in motion. We're considering various events in the physical world. Or the, and the scientists are trying to come up with universal generalizations that, describing the behavior of certain kinds of matter. Now, let's take one elementary example. Of course, it will have to be elementary because that's all the science I know, if that. Uh, let's take Boyle's law, which is that uh, uh, if you multiply the pressure on a gas times the volume, you'll get a constant. So uh, increasing the pressure on a gas will decrease the volume. So let's just consider that given this law of PV equals K. So what do we see when we're looking at this if we remember what the symbols stand for, which in my old age is difficult? Uh, that was supposed to be a joke. You can laugh now. Uh, okay, so th this lo these laws of which this is just one example don't make any reference to purposes or ends that anyone has. Uh, we wouldn't say unless we're just trying to come up with some picturesque exact way of explaining the law to children. We wouldn't say uh, the volume of the gas is trying to adjust to the increased pressure in order to maintain this constant. Uh, uh, physical bodies don't, uh, don't have conscious purposes or goals. What we're doing in the sciences is just trying to come up with constant relationships between matter, uh, changes in matter of various kinds. So, we're, we're making no reference to purposes. But people, although of course people, at least the ones I know, uh, are physical bodies, I don't want to assume any, I'm not begging any questions on whether the notion of a 
of a mind without a body makes sense, or whether if there were minds without the body, we could call the mind a person. But the people we know at any rate are physical bodies, but they don't just move in the same way physical bodies do. That's to say, we don't just, uh, can't just say, well, people, uh, it isn't, there's more to human beings than just saying they consist of matter of certain kinds and we can, they're subject to certain physical relationships. People also have purposes and try to achieve goals. This is unlike matters. We wouldn't say, uh, as I said, um, the gas is trying to react in a certain way because it has this purpose, but we would say that about people. People have act, which, as you heard in the previous lectures, is when we're acting, we have a goal and we're using means to achieve ends. I understand in the previous two lectures, people have given an example, uh, suppose someone wants a ham sandwich, so then they would have, that's their goal, and then they would have means to achieve that goal, getting the ham and the bread. Now, I, I wondered about that example. I must say, uh, you know, I don't want to make any insinuations, but it sounds a bit anti-Semitic to me. <laughs> uh, now, if, uh, if you look at uh, Murray Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State, uh, Rothbard certainly can't be accused of anti-Semitism, but he gives the same example, except in when he gives the example, he has uh, something like a man wants a ham sandwich, and so he's, he gets his wife to make it for him. <laughs> now, I suppose we couldn't give it that way either. Then he'd probably be, if he did that, he'd be expelled from the university these days, at least up before some sort of panel. But regardless of what you think of that example, uh, human beings are different from uh, what uh, matter is studied in the physical science because human beings have ends and uh, uh, purposes and uh, human beings act, that's to say, use means to achieve end. Now, uh, there's a complication here. There usually is, especially in my lectures. Uh, there are some people who think that Nature has purposes, not in the sense that these people think that uh, matter is conscious and is aiming at various things, so we could have a praxeology of matter, although maybe there are people like that. I mean, there, there are all sorts of crazy people out there. But uh, the people who, who say that nature has purposes, uh, think that in addition to the kind of causation studied in the physical sciences in which we have, say, a change in one event is will produce a change in another event, we can appeal to the notion of an end or a final cause, something that a goal that some natural process is aiming at, not in the sense that it's consciously pursuing that goal, but just that the what the physical entity is doing can be explained in terms of that goal. This comes up, is used very much in Aristotle's philosophy. It's called a teleological view. But Mises doesn't like that. He doesn't, he really doesn't discuss that, but that wouldn't be, he just from what he sells, says elsewhere, it's clear that he doesn't go along with that way of viewing things. So the way he's looking at uh, both sciences and economics are human action, which is the use of means to achieve ends, and then there's the physical sciences, and there isn't this notion of uh, purpose without conscious intentions that would be not classifiable in the way that he has. Now, someone might object to Mises, uh, where Mises say the economics, or part of this more general science of praxeology, 
is required to study uh, to how uh, purpose is a gives you a kind of knowledge because they would say, doesn't history study action? In history, we're concerned, say, with uh, questions like, uh, why did Caesar cross the Rubicon in 49 BC? Or uh, why did uh, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor a few years after that? So uh, another joke, incidentally. So, People might say, well, don't we already have a discipline that studies uh, human action, namely history, so why do we need this separate discipline of praxeology? And here, the crucial point to realize is that history doesn't give us general laws. It's just explaining how particular events have taken place and what the reasons for those events were. But Economics does come up with general laws, and this is exactly what Mises thought was the uh, distinctive part of economics, uh, the distinctive contribution to the theory of knowledge, that even though it, does, it doesn't use the method of the physical sciences, it's still able to come up with general laws, unlike history. Now, uh, how do we know that human beings act? Well, we see actions all the time. We see each of us acts, and we're able to grasp the actions of other people. I mean, there, you can think of any number of examples, even if other than this horrible example of the ham sandwich, say, uh, we, I'm now giving a lecture, so I have an end, and I have the means to do that. I mean, you could come up with other actions like walking out of my lecture, say you didn't like my lecture and you walked out, then you'd have an end and a, a means to do that. Of course, we would note your name if you tried to do that. Uh, okay, so what's crucial if we want to study human action is we can't understand action unless we use certain concepts like ends or means. And there's nothing in saying that we have to employ certain concepts in order to understand action. Uh, there's nothing mysterious about this. Uh, Mises talks about a priori concepts in people. Uh, there are some people, as soon as they see the word a priori, they react in horror. They'll think, oh, well, this is some kind of Kantian terminology, and we know from uh, reading Ayn Rand that Kant is the worst person of all time, so there must be some big problem here. I mean, uh, uh, since uh, uh, how could Mises be possibly talk about the a priori, or some people just don't like, who are not supporters of Ayn Rand, don't like the notion of the a priori. But I think when Mises is talking about a priori concept, he means something quite unproblematic, just that we have to have these concepts in order to understand action. Uh, just as an example, uh, supposing you hear people speaking a foreign language that you don't know, which you can very easily do here at this conference. So unless you learn the language, you won't understand what they're saying. They'll, you'll know they're saying something, but you won't be able to understand what they're talking about. So here in this a similar idea, I think, in uh, when talking about a priori concept, just in the, in the way in which we have to have certain concepts in order to understand a foreign language, Mises is suggesting we have to have certain concepts in order to understand action. Unless we use these concepts, we won't understand what's going on when people are acting. So in, in, this is what he means by a priori, uh, that you have to have grasp in order to make sense of actions. Now, a, a misunderstanding here is 
when he says that the concepts are a priori, it doesn't imply that these concepts are innate, that we're born with these concepts, or that we have them somehow in our mind and they're just triggered by outside experience. He isn't giving, when he talks about a priori concepts, he isn't giving us some philosophical theory of how people acquire concepts. Uh, if you say you're an empiricist about concepts, that's to say, suppose you think we get concepts by abstracting from the world, or that's uh, one theory, I think one that uh, Rand suggests. You could hold that theory if you wanted and still accept Mises' notion of the a priori, all that would follow is until you got these concepts, you wouldn't be able to understand human action. But a priori, as I say, doesn't mean any, doesn't imply any controversial philosophical theory about how concepts are acquired. It's just saying you have to grasp these concepts in order to understand action. Now we'll see <clears throat> in a little, I'm actually going to cover this in one of my other lectures, a priori knowledge is different from a priori concepts. What I'm going to talk about here is just a priori concepts. Uh, now, so as I suggested, Mises says we can study action, we do so by examining these a priori concepts that we need in order to understand action. And Mises called this study, the study of human action, praxeology. And in his earlier book, uh, Epistemological Problems of Economics, which was written in the 30s, he called it sociology. But that isn't such a good name because it's, of course, used for something else. So here, uh, we want to distinguish a very a strict sense of talking about praxeology and a looser use of the term. When Mises talked about praxeology, he meant strictly the science or the study of human action. So the method that you're using is not, in the strict sense, praxeology, the method of this deductive method or the method of looking at the implication of the concept, isn't strictly praxeology, but there's a looser sense in which people will call this method praxeology also. And I, I don't think that's wrong. It's just not the strict way Mises was using it. Obviously, I don't think it's wrong because I myself used it in the title in the lecture for this way. And if I said it was wrong, I'd have to admit that I made a mistake, which I've done, but I don't like doing that. <laughs> now, uh, when uh, we say that the method of praxeology makes use of the a priori, I think people make this idea much harder than it actually is, and people uh, say, well, this is very abstract and hard to understand, and they raise various problems that really rest on misunderstanding. And one of the most basic uh, points to remember that will, if you remember this, I think it'll clear up a lot of difficulties people have about praxeology, is that a priori does not mean mental. So when Mises is talking about a priori concepts of action, he's not talking about what's going on in his mind or other people's minds. He's talking about actions, uh, events that take place in the real world, events that take place out there, like in this horrible example of the ham sandwich. He isn't just talking about ideas of a ham sandwich. He's talking about actual sandwich out there. Uh, I guess he, uh, who at these lectures just didn't consider the anti-Semitic implications, but that's, I don't want to get sidetracked again. If I get sidetracked too much, I'm going to start 
going over Molyneux's philosophy, and then they <laughs> get rid of me. Okay, now, uh, what happens if you make this mistake? You say, well, uh, you're thinking, he's talking about a priori, so this means somehow mental. Then this leads to a misunderstanding. I've heard, I've been coming to this uh, program for a great many years, and someone nearly always will raise this question. They'll say, well, how does Mises know that when he's coming up with all these claimed laws about human action, how does he know that he's talking about anything other than what's going on in his own mind? How does he know that this applies to anyone else other than, than Mises himself? I mean, just as a matter of interest, has anyone thought of that or wondered about that question? Uh, well, I guess you're better, you're better than the people who've been coming around here for the past 27 years, if you haven't had that thought. But what is wrong with that question? What is the presupposition of that question that I think is mistaken? Is that Mises is not <clears throat> raising the same kind of question Descartes did. Remember, Descartes, at the inauguration of modern philosophy, raised a problem somewhat like this. He said, he was trying to say, uh, is what, if anything, can he know in the sense that it's immune to doubt? And he suggested the physical world isn't something like that, that we could just imagine that uh, we're being somehow deceived that there really isn't a physical world, so the physical world is subject to doubt. And he then <clears throat> went on to argue that he couldn't doubt his own existence, and from that he tried to prove that the physical world did exist. He said, well, he could prove then that God existed and God wouldn't deceive us, so if he thinks he could get a proof the physical world exists. So, what Descartes is doing, he's starting with his own consciousness and then saying, how does, how do we know the physical world exists? And many philosophers, although very few uh, accept the way Descartes uh, solved the problem, write about this problem. How do we know that the world exists, the problem of skepticism? Uh, what is the basis of our knowledge? Now, this is not... Mises' project. He's not engaged in some kind of skeptical uh, solution to skepticism where he's saying, I'm starting with my own consciousness and then I'm trying to deduce the existence of the world. Uh, he, he is not, <clears throat> excuse me, writing as a, uh, as a philosopher, <clears throat> but as an economist, he's not engaged really, although he deals with issues in theory of knowledge. He's not engaged in this kind of fundamental project. <clears throat> he's starting from his own, from the external world, so he's taking for granted. Let me just see, is there any water? Oh, good, there's some water down here for me. Good. They think, they think of everything. <clears throat> or, <clears throat> or at least, if not everything, at least they thought of that. Uh, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, I guess, uh, I guess there are some people who don't want me to continue the lecture, probably. I don't know how they managed to do that. Well, all right, so Mises' question is not how do we know the external world exists, but given that we do understand actions, how is this possible? So he's saying, what are the concepts that we have that enable us to understand human action? So as I said earlier, some people say, how do we know that the conclusions of praxeology apply to other people? And this question really rests on a false assumption because the assumption is that Mises is starting just from his own 
thoughts or his own actions and then he's asking how can we generalize that to others but he's saying no we find just as a matter of experience that we grasp people's actions i can see that you're all now intently listening to what i say so i can just grasp <coughs> i can just grasp that you're doing that <coughs> no, excuse me again so he's asking how are we able to do that how we can see what, uh, an example how this basic mistake leads us in leads us into error if we look at about what Mises says about polylogism that uh, I don't know I assume he invented that word I haven't seen it used by other writers he he uh, it, it's an interesting word and the, the view, the polylogist view, is a view that different races or classes have different logics. For example, the time Mises was writing, the Nazis suggested that different races had different logics. They would talk about, uh, say, Jewish physics versus Aryan physics. There was a, actually a Nobel Prize winning German physicist who wrote a book called German physics in several volumes. So in this view, uh, in this polylog, and we find it also say in the Marxists, at least some Marxists had the view that the different economic classes had different logic. So there was a proletarian logic and a capitalist logic. So in the polylogist view, there isn't a single set of a priori concepts that applies to all actions. So if you're a polylogist, you would say, well, what Mises is talking about is just possibly right about the when he's trying to understand the actions of a particular class or race, but it isn't universal. So what does Mises respond to that? Well, he says, uh, we just find that our categories do apply universally. So he doesn't come up with an impossibility proof. He doesn't come up with some way of saying, uh, look, the polylogist position is logically contradictory. But he says that, in fact, this is what we do. We look at people's actions, whether regardless of what race or class they are, and we find uh, we can understand them using the same set of categories. So he said it's just a matter of what we find in experience that this set of categories will enable us to understand all human actions. Now, although you don't find, at least in uh, very much in standard academic writings, uh, people who are polylogists in the sense of saying people have different races have different ways of thinking. But there is a version of polylogism that's popular among some contemporary anthropologists. And seeing what, uh, what's wrong with this, or how what uh, will, I think, enable us to understand what Mises is doing in praxeology better. There's one. Uh, anthropologist, I think, recently retired from University of Chicago, Marshall Sollins, who's quite, been quite influential. And he's a, he was following a fr early French anthropologist, Marcel Mauss, who was, all of you I assume know, was Durkheim's nephew. Uh, or was it son-in-law? I can't remember. I should have, I don't know, but one, one of the two, but not both. Uh, so, uh, he, Solins claims that economic rationality doesn't apply to Stone Age tribes and also to many other societies. And what Solins says is in these societies, people don't engage in regular economic transactions. They, they go out and buy and sell things. They just give gifts to each other and then they'll expect to get gifts in return. So. What Solomon says, if look, these economists such as Mises who talk about these universal categories are all wrong because that just applies to Western societies or uh, just a certain his other historical societies. We can find groups of 
people who don't act in accord with this, the economic categories that economists are talking about. But this objection really depends on a mistake about praxeology, because what the objection is that uh, is that people in the Stone Age societies aren't really concerned with amassing material goods in the same way that people today are. They're concerned more with getting along with other people in the tribe by giving gifts to them. So the mistake that's made if this is given as an objection to praxeology is that praxeology means you're not assuming that actions are limited to one or a few goals like getting as much money as you can. Uh, what praxeology is studying is the structure, the form involved in any action. It's not studying particular actions or the content, but just the form of an action. We can, by, if, and it's very cru it's crucial we understand this notion of the form of an action. I think one way to try to understand this, compare it with a logical form. Maybe I'm just introducing another difficult concept to explain this, but I will try, well, I hope not. But I mean, supposing we take any statement or proposition such as uh, I am now giving a lecture, we could distinguish, say, the subject of the lecture, the subject of the, set of the statement, I, and then we'd have the verb, am giving, am giving, and then the object. So we could get for any sentence, we could just say, regardless of the content of the sentence, it would have a certain form, a kind of grammatical form, we could get the logical form. So what Mises is suggesting is actions can be studied in the same way. We can come up with the form of any action that is, so we, we're not talking about what are the particular goals that people have. We talk about the form, the, the logical form involved, or the, the uh, in any action, the structure involved in any action, and that's what praxeology is studying. And the one of these basic principles of action I, I mentioned in the other lectures I've already talked about so far is that every action uses a means to attain an end. And here we have to bear in mind that we talk about any action, so we're not limited to carefully thought out projects, supposing, say, I impulsively say, well, I've had enough and just run out the room. That would be an action also, even though I wouldn't have been thinking about it very long or would just be sudden, move out the room and then everyone would applaud. So action isn't limited to these carefully thought out project. And again, I've mentioned this before, but I want to keep mentioning this because it's very important that it, it concerns what's going on in the world, not what you're thinking about, but what's actually happening. So habitual behavior can start, can counts as action too. Supposing, say, when you get up, you put your clothes on, you just get dressed, you really aren't thinking about it very much, you just do it it's kind of semi-automatically, that counts as action also studied, studied by praxeology. And so does behavior explained by Freud's psychology. Mises was actually quite interested in Freud. And, uh, Freud was a friend of his, although not a close friend, but they he, they, they knew each other. So Mises was very interested in, say, ideas that when somebody does something, he really has some kind of motive in mind that is not what appears on the surface of the kind studied in psychoanalysis. So that would count as action also for praxeology. It, so it's whenever you can use the categories of ends and means, you have an action. 
now, so far that doesn't sound like a very controversial claim that action is, all action involves the use of means to achieve an end. But Mises now goes on to make a claim that will be very controversial, at least to most people, is that all action is rational. That sounds very strange when you first hear it because you would think, well, aren't there all sorts of crazy things people could say or do? I'm not going to give any examples of them because that would get me into trouble among certain websites would launch their attacks on me if I gave examples of this. So I'm not going to do that. But doesn't it sound like a very strange thing to say if you say, well, all action is rational. But although it sounds odd, Mises doesn't intend anything particularly controversial. He's just repeating, in a way, this non-controversial claim that all action involves the use of means to achieve an end, because that's his criterion of rationality, use of means to achieve an end. So if you accept that, then he's not saying anything else by saying that all action is rational. So he, he doesn't mean that action is rational in other senses of rationality. Uh, for example, people can make mistakes in reasoning. They do it all the time, and their behaviorist, behavioral economists like Richard Thaler and uh, Daniel Kahneman, who've studied or at least, uh, actions, they claim people make all sorts of mistakes in reasoning. So I say, well, people really aren't rational. But Mises isn't, when he says action is rational, he's not saying that people always reason correctly. All he's saying is that people, from their point of view, are using the means that they think will enable them to achieve their end. So they can use means that will fail to achieve their ends. They just say they, they pick the wrong means to achieve the end, but th they think that what they're doing will enable them to get what they want. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it. So this is enough to count as rational for Mises. Now, here in saying that, Mises differed from his, a friend of his, who, the uh, great German sociologist Max Weber. Uh, Weber distinguished four types of action. I'm not going into the details of Weber's classification, but uh, he had purposive, rational, valuational, effective, and customary traditional. So the purposive, rational, for him, meant conscious calculation, say someone wanted to make money, so he came up with some project, say he thought, well, he could sell something at a profit, he'd make, let's say he'd make uh, uh, little dolls of Mises and sell them to children, so it would be a very popular toy and everybody would get, he'd make a lot of money because all the children want to have these Ludwig von Mises dolls. So that would be an example of, of calcul purposive rational behavior because it would be calculative. But all of the behaviors uh, or action Weber was talking about count as rational for Mises. He's, not again, having a very, very easy criterion to fill for uh, to fulfill for rational behavior, all you have to be, to be rational in Mises' sense, all you have to do is use a means to achieve an end. And another point at which uh, Mises differed from Weber is that Weber thought that rational action was what he called an ideal type, which is an abstraction that exaggerates various features in the world, but doesn't strictly apply to the world. So an ideal type is a, an abstraction that really isn't present in the world, according to uh, Weber. But Mises did not, repeat, not think that 
his concept, concepts of praxeology are ideal types in that sense. He thought they really do apply to the world in the full sense. They're not ideal types. I notice in a recent book by uh, Peter Betke uh, thinks that does say, I was surprised that uh, Mises thinks that the concepts of praxeology are ideal types, and he, you should be aware that that, that isn't correct. He spe specifically repudiates that view. I don't know why he said that, but it isn't a correct view. Now, what are, I've said so far that Mises thinks there is that we can study human action by looking at the implications of certain concepts. But what are some of the things we could learn about action by studying it in this conceptual way that Mises is talking about? Well, one is that, according to him, is that action involves felt dissatisfaction. Uh, you're acting because you want to change things for the better. So it doesn't mean that you are you have to be feeling uh, bad in some sense or you're, feel, uh, you're sort of in some kind of psychological state that uh, you don't like and then you think you can do something to get out of it, say something like you say, well, I've got a headache, so I think if I take some aspirin, I'll feel better. He's not talking about felt dissatisfaction in that sense. It's just that you think that by acting, you'll be able to improve things. Now, strictly speaking, that's, there's a slight modification we could make, but I'm not going to go into that because I'm making this too complicated already. So basically, so he says action involves a felt dissatisfaction. You want things to get better. Now, it doesn't follow from that that supposing you're, you made a choice that you're satisfied with, say it works out the way you want, that it doesn't imply that things are always getting better for you. Say you're dissatisfied with things, so you think, say I have a headache and I think I'll take aspirin, and it works so I, that I feel better, but it doesn't follow from that, you might think it does, but it doesn't, that things are always going to get better. That's it. I'm, I'm not thinking of a case where you made a mistake, like say you uh, take, you want to get better from your headache, so you take some extra strength Tylenol that somebody's laced with poison. I'm not thinking of a case like that. I'm thinking about a case where you actually do uh, succeed in in, in in dealing with your felt dissatisfaction, but it doesn't follow from that that on the whole you're getting better. You could be getting worse on the whole. It's just that if your action's successful, you'll be better than if you hadn't acted. So your overall condition could be getting worse, say, but you're at least doing what you did will has improved things. Now all action, according to Mises, involves choice. Uh, we always have various ends we could pursue. You could, instead of coming to my lecture, you could have done something else, probably. Many of you are thinking, well, you made a mistake. You should have done something else. But again, it's too late now. If you leave now, we're noting your name. So that was another joke, incident. So, According to Mises, we always choose the end that we rank highest at the time. Now, some philosophers don't accept this view. Uh, they say, look, there are cases where we don't uh, always choose our highest valued goal. And they would have in mind a case like this. Uh, supposing someone thinks that smoking is bad for your health. So he, he thinks, well, if I smoke, this will increase my chance of getting lung cancer. And so I don't, I don't want to do that. So I don't want to smoke. And that's more important to me 
than whatever pleasure I get from smoking. So the person sm says, well, it turns out he, he smokes anyway. He'll just light up, even though he holds that, according to these philosophers, he holds that uh, smoking is bad, but, and he also thinks the fact that the badness of smoking outweighs that whatever pleasure he gets from smoking, but he smokes anyway. So the philosophers who speak of this describe this as weakness of will, or in the Greek term, akrasia. So the idea they have is, well, you could have a highest preference in the sense you're ranking something highest, but you don't do that because there are various theories on how this takes place that you're somehow, you're, you're, you wind up doing something that isn't your highest value goal. Now, as Mises would analyze a case like this, a praxeologist would analyze a case like this, you would say, well, the person at the time he was acting just changed his mind about what was the highest value goal. When he was acting, he just, at that time, whatever he thought he'd get out, the pleasure of getting the, what he thought he'd get from smoking, did outweigh these other factors against it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have smoked. So it could be that immediately afterwards, he would regret his action. So we could have weakness of will in kind of a weak, a weak sense of weakness of will that where the person always, or almost always regrets certain kinds of action. But in Mises' view, you couldn't have what they call in philosophy strong acrasia, which is this view that you can act against what choose something other than your highest value preference. So that view is one that Mises wouldn't help. I will say, in uh, thinking about uh, is someone smoking, even though it's bad for you, it reminded me of the story of someone who read so much about how bad smoking is for you that he gave up reading. Uh, okay, now, uh, Another of the principles that Mises uh, says we can learn just by thinking about the concept of action is what he calls methodological individualism. And this is the, what he means by this is the, the notion that only individuals act. So if we talk about a collective action, entity such as a class or a nation, when we say, suppose that we say something like, the United States declared war on Japan December 8th, 1941. So, according to the methodological individualist, this would have to be analyzed as talking about the actions of particular individuals. Say, uh, President Roosevelt gave a speech December 8th, and after he gave a speech, various pe people in Congress voted for a declaration of war, and then this resulted in further actions by other individuals. So it, we couldn't say, according to the methodological individualist, that the United States declared war, and that's all there is to it, that there there, it, that can't be analyzed further. So it's only, it's only individuals act. I'll just say, in passing here, uh, Oscar Levant, who was a, I'm sure, a figure you don't remember, he goes back a long way, was a very good uh, uh, composer and humorist. He once said, he wondered, why is it we can say, uh, Hitler invaded Russia or Germany invaded Russia, but we can't say uh, uh, Germany invaded Stalin or Hitler invaded Stalin. Uh, something, something to think about, but that won't be on the final exam, that question. Uh, 
I do have some limits. So one thing about methodological individualism, when we say only individuals act, this view doesn't deny that nations or classes exist. It isn't saying there's no such thing as the United States or all that really exists are individuals, just saying that it's only individuals who act. Now, uh, what I've been giving in the lecture various claims about action that Mises has made, such as that uh, just I just gave only individuals act, or action involves choosing your highest value preference. Oh, how do we know that these claims are true? How do we know uh, that Mises is right? It, Mises' answer is, well, we just think about the concept of action and what it involves. So what we're doing, according to him, is just trying to make explicit what we already implicitly know. In his view, we have a we, we have the a priori concept of action. And what we're doing in praxeology is studying this. So we're trying to understand what, in a sense, we already know. So sometimes people are a bit confused. I'll say, well, the Mises system is deductive. So in a deductive system, they think, say, in mathematics, you start with certain axioms or postulates, and we don't really ask, how do you know the axioms or postulates are true? They're just assumed, and then we try to draw deductive consequences from them. But praxeology is the way, in the way Mises conducts it isn't like that. They're not, we don't start with arbitrary postulates, but we, uh, we start with, with uh, concepts and principles that we already know, and we know these to be true because they enable us to make sense of action. Well, all right, I'm finished now. I think uh, uh, I was supposed to, uh, Mark, did you want to make the announcement? I